Please welcome Natasha Chen. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much um, for having me. Um, it's really great to to see you guys and to um, to be here. I'm I, I'm really impressed, and you know um, I'm envious of the um, environments you're in. This is really really wonderful. Very different from um, the um, the SVA uh, that I knew before. You know, it was sort of like pre um, pre user experience time when um, the design of the space was just really you know academic. Let's put it that way. Um, so thanks for having me, and um, since you know it's a pretty intimate setting here, and I'm just gonna kind of like run through um, a couple projects that we've been working on, you know, over the past um, two years, and um, a little bit about um, myself. Okay, so I titled the talk today um, "Flatland." Um, as you know, um, our sort of um, professional discipline is um, graphic design. And graphic design is essentially um, a kind of two-dimensional means to convey messages, you know, to um, express um, things. And um, as graphic designers, you know, um, a lot of us, including myself, sometimes feel really frustrated by that. We're just really confined by the um, media definition of what we do. Um, I think over the last few years, you know, we um, as a group, me and my team, we really try to kind of, you know, get out of that boundary, um, not only by the choice of our um, projects, but more so by how we do it and how we can actually allow other medium or other methods to inform our work, therefore to actually really kind of define or, you know, expand the idea of, you know, flatness. And um, I think the, 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 the projects that I brought in today sort of, you know, um, illustrate that kind of ent attempt, you know. Some are great, some um, are really painful, you know, for different reasons. So um, before um, I show you guys the projects, I just want to talk a little bit um, about myself. So I'm from Taiwan um, in Southeast Asia. It's a very, very small island. Um, Taiwan is a highly, highly congested um, place, um, especially the city um, where I'm from, Taipei, um, is the capital of the um, island. And as you can see here, um, the, 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 the kind of prox prox um, proximity between people is really, really tight. And it kind of, you know, I think shaped a kind of sense of space, you know, um, while I was growing up. But I was not really aware of it until like now, looking back. And I feel that, you know, I'm, I'm a lot more comfortable with a lot of people um, surrounding me. I, I, my sense of privacy is actually quite different, you know, from the kind of conventional um, norm of privacy. Um, and then um, in Taipei, um, it's, a, it's a really kind of vibrant, you know, um, urban uh, space. And you, you can see here, um, what's really incredible is the signage um, there. You know, the streets are just packed with um, these street signs, you know, in all kinds of um, typefaces and all kinds of shapes and colors. And growing up, I just thought that the whole world um, was like this, but clearly not, you know. And now thinking back, this kind of vernacular is really influencing um, the way that um, I do graphic design. You know, it's this kind of exuberance um, quality and the collage quality that you can actually see in our work. And then a lot of people um, actually don't know that um, Taiwan uh, was colonized by Japan in the 30s. Um, so there's a lot of kind of, you know, cultural influence from Japan and sort of kind of residual uh, cultural productions are still very much in, um, in a contemporary society. So as a kid, I really grew up with a lot of the um, cultural stuff from Japan, you know, going from um, comic books to, um, monsters, Godzillas, you know, so it's pretty much like the stuff that we watch and read, you know, as a kid. But again, it was just so natural to us. And now that thinking back, this kind of um, very, a little bit kind of, you know, um, fanta fantastical, but also bizarre, you know, cultural influence, again, plays a very important part um, in, in, in our design um, practice. 
And then, you know, of course, you know, popular culture, um, very much, you know, like the fashion um, from Japan. And as you can see here, it's just like a really crazy collage of, you know, all the shapes and colors and fonts and, you know, all kinds of styles that you can imagine, right? So our work, you know, um, as a team takes on this kind of quality. And um, I have a very um, small team. We have about um, 10 um, full-time designers from um, different disciplines. And I, told, I sort of see myself um, not so much as a, as, a, as a designer, you know, and um, not really not a graphic designer because I don't really design on the computer um, anymore. But I rather see myself as a kind of editor. Um, I, um, I really allow um, our team members, the designers, to come up with their vision and their solution for a project. I cannot sketch, therefore um, I don't draw. I cannot even like, you know, sketch the shape of a logo, not to mention you know, some sort of you know, um, 3D sketch for anything. So um, I will allow my designers to come up with their ideas and interpretations for a project, and I help them to edit things out, to actually sharpen it. So the work that you see you know, um, here is really not my design, but rather the point of views from a collection of people here and you begin to kind of see um, there are a lot of different tendencies and different impulses and even sensibilities but somehow as a whole they kind of all make sense um, together so um, quickly you know um, we we um, we work on um, a lot of different types of um, project um, of different um, complexities different scales and um, different fees, okay, or different um, budgets. Um, <coughs> budgets are always critical um, in a design process because you do need um, certain budget to materialize things, right? Um, so we encounter a lot of situations where they're really like there's no budget. So you know, as a as a designer and um, as a design business, you can either say no to things just because you can kind of imagine what's going to happen, right? It's a kind of down hill road or you can try to make something happen within this given project so um, this exhibition is sort of you know um, that story about um, budgetary constraints and how we actually take some very very simple graphic elements and expand it and explode it and morph it into something that's entirely different so um, new practices um, is an award that um, the Center for Architecture has um, once every two years so it's a kind of tradition you know, started out um, in 2006. So you, you see that these are um, just different identities done by different designers over time. They're all great. But um, when we were asked to um, imagine the new identity for new practices, first thing that we thought was that, well, you know, it doesn't matter what the identity is, it will have to be spatialized some way because there's always an exhibition. Um, for the winners to exhibit their work, you know, inside the, um, the, the, the center. So the idea of, you know, spatializing an identity was really, really important just from the very beginning. These are the um, winners, you know, from um, 2014, six winners. There are always six winners, and these six winners' work will be exhibited inside the space. So what we did um, for the identity um, was actually something pretty simple. So it's made up with um, three lines. And you know, when you have one line, it's a line. But when you have two lines, you have a plane. And when you have three lines, you have space. So it's, it's a very kind of you know, abstract, but also um, explicit idea um, about architecture um, itself. But when it's flat, it is just you know, a logo with um, the word mark. And then these three lines then can become um, this kind of activation um, tool that um, allows images and content to come through. Okay, so here the lines sort of like swipers, you know, they just swipe in and out um, different graphics. And we do want to have this kind of very street um, quality, you know, to express the energy um, of the competition. And also, you know, the winners, their um, early um, young practices. So we want to express that. And then, you know, um, when it's in the kind of printed material, you begin to see the usefulness of this strategy. You know, not only that the lines um, can function as a logo, but also function as a kind of organizational um, tool here. 
All right, and um, we had to design the exhibition. So the exhibition was really um, the most exciting part um, for us. But then we, we, we looked at, you know, just typical um, exhibitions for, um, for architecture content. And we realized that there's definitely a kind of tendency happening, you know, which I think is a result of budgetary constraint, which is that you see is oftentimes the images <coughs> and content are printed on foam cord. And then the foam cords are mounted on the walls, right? And then you walk in, you just see walls and walls of um, foam cords. And, we didn't want that. Um, so we began to kind of look at how we can use um, the identity elements, essentially the three lines to actually activate um, the space. But then um, we had a lot of different ideas, you know. Uh, and then we kind of ran into a problem, which was that there was literally like no budget um, to materialize the exhibition, you know. Um, Surprisingly, so um, we came up with a solution that basically used two essential materials. Okay, one is duct tape, and the total cost for duct tape that we used for the exhibition was two hundred and fifty-three dollars, and then IKEA frames. Um, the total cost was three hundred and eighty-two. We pretty much did the entire um, exhibition with this amount of budget. And of course, there was like vinyl, you know, um, type a little bit. But um, most of the typography in the space was made up with um, the duct tape. So, um, so this is the result. As you can see that all these lines um, are made up with um, duct tape. And fortunately, we didn't have to go into a space and tape this ourselves, right? We had a very great um, installation team. And um, these um, lines began to carve out um, different zones for the winners. But then also, these lines connect these winners into a cohesive whole. Okay, so different view. And there are these pedestals. They're also connected um, by these lines. Okay, so all of a sudden the space feels entirely different and activated. So, you know, um, there, there, there were um, quotes and, you know, messages in the space. And since we had no money, we had to um, use a duct tape to tape up um, these words. So we created um, this, we call it, it's not really a font. It's basically type that's made up with duct tape. So we call it MPNY duct tape grotesque, okay. And then we did um, tape all the messages um, on the wall, okay? So again, it was a kind of very um, low-tech kind of approach to, um, to, a, to a spatial problem as well as a graphic design problem as well as a budget problem. And um, you see this kind of you know, um, ambition kind of reoccurs in our projects over and over again. Um, and we don't feel like kind of intimidated by the, um, by the lack of bu project um, budget, but rather we feel like really encouraged by that. Okay, so here's another view um, downstairs. Okay, another um, pretty much low budget um, project, and it was also no fee, okay, zero, really. Like the entire pro project was um, labor of love, and um, there was no fee to this. So it's for the um, American Pavilion in the um, 2014 Venice Architecture um, Biennale. So just to really zoom out on the theme um, of 2014's um, Biennale. So the curator um, was Rem Kuhaus. So he had a very big question um, for architects to, to answer, which is, you know, um, to, to examine how modernity really erased national um, identity. So these two images um, kind of demonstrate that. So here you can see that these are um, photos of, you know, uh, buildings, um, built environments taken in different countries, say like, you know, um, 80 years ago, right? You begin to see that there are very different characteristics, okay, from one country to the next. But here, this is 2016, okay? Completely replaced by um, this kind of homogenous glass and concrete um, structure, and which is a kind of condition of um, urbanization right now, right? So, um, so Rem had this very big question. So um, it was a competition um, to begin with. Um, 
so my um, my friend, um, who is also um, the curator for um, of storefront, um, she's a director of storefront for art and architecture, um, Eva Frank. She um, was actually ambitious enough to actually enter um, the competition. So she um, called me, okay, she said, Natasha, I got this really important project that I would like to enter, you gotta help me. So I said, okay, what is that? And she says, Office US. And I said, what is Office US? Really, at that time, this was 2013, I had no idea about um, the whole Biennale at all. So I said, what is Office US? And then she explained, you know, her kind of, you know, conceptual basis and the idea. She wanted to really look at um, the um, architectural history, the um, the built environments in the USA over the course of, first of all, 100 years, okay, that's a whole century, and then through 1,000 examples, 1,000 case studies, okay, and then she also wanted to create a real working office um, at the site, at the Biennale, so the exhibition itself could also be or um, would be a working office with real scholars and, you know, um, designers, architects working in that great okay so when i when we finished the phone call really you know this was kind of uh what i thought what went through my mind right you know so you just look at the sheer number of things you know 100 years 1000 projects and then um a real working office like I don't care what these things are, but the fact is that we'll have to design all these things that actually cover such a broad um, span of you know topics and you know case studies. It's really really crazy, right? But you know, out of professionalism, I said no problem. Okay, <laughs> let's let's let, let's go for it. And also knowing that it would be a nonprofit. Um, no fee um, project. So you know the the the, the first question that um, that that came to uh, my mind was that how could we actually really do this? You know, not only to do a great project, but also to um, sustain um, a business simultaneously. So you know, we're always negotiating between our own um, oftentimes limited resources with our own ambitions and with the demand of a project. So. Um, we um, we pretty much quickly learned that um, the project will be a really collaborative effort, you know, amongst um, many, many, many designers and architects and scholars and researchers, you know, so that we knew before we even um, entered the competition. Great, we knew that we would have a lot of people, okay, to help us out. Really, it was just like, okay, we got an army here, you know, they're not necessarily graphic designers, but if we actually design in such a way that we can actually work with them and use their skill sets, it will be amazing. That was just really like a very quick um, and immediate conclusion right away. So we start to think about, okay, how do we actually deal with identities, you know? So when you, when you design an identity, not only that you need to design the logo, you know, which is sometimes a shape, um, oftentimes it's a word mark, and in, in this case, a word mark would be um, more appropriate. So we knew that, okay, we're designing um, a word mark, Office US, right? It needs a word mark. But then what we um, experienced, you know, over like years of working, when it comes to file exchange is that it doesn't matter how you pack the fonts, okay? You can collect them, you pack them properly, you send them to people. When people open the files, I would say like eight out of 10 times, we will be asked, by, um, by, the, by the recipient why the fonts are missing. So, you know, like missing fonts is always a big problem. It doesn't matter if you're graphic designers or not, you know, and especially when you're working with non-graphic designers, this kind of thing would happen very, very frequently. So we um, decided that, okay, we don't want this, all right, how can we actually prevent this from just even happening so that we don't get bothered um, at all. So we looked into um, just basically, Typefaces, they're available um, on any operating systems, you know, ASCII typefaces, and there aren't actually that many choices, and actually a lot of them are really, really weird and kooky and, you know, inappropriate, you know. So um, we quickly just determined that we wanted a sincere typeface and we wanted a serif typeface just for pure utilitarian purposes, you know. We didn't even know how um, these will be used, but we just determined that, okay, we need um, both to actually work for such a large scale projects and potentially there's a lot of content and potentially diagrams. So we just pick 
Ariel and um, Times New Roman. So, you know, um, Ariel is sort of like, you know, a kind of inferior version of Helvetica. And we actually like that because of the low tech and low budget quality of the, um, of the project. And then Times New Roman, you know, was actually designed um, by, was actually commissioned by the, um, by the newspaper at the Times in 1931. So we thought that, well, this is a pretty, you know, um, cool um, pairing with, um, Ariel, so let's just go with that, okay? So, here we go. Um, here's the watermark Office US. And the reason why we italicize US is because if we didn't, it would read Ophesius, which is sort of like Greek. So um, we, we, we italicize that just so that it reads Office US, great. So, you know, this is a very, very simple, um, and decisive, really decisive um, kiddo parts for an identity, you know. Um, we didn't want to even introduce a, a color palette just because we didn't even know at that time how complex the projects would be, the 1,000 projects would be. So we thought that let's just stick with black and white. No pen tone, nobody would have to like pick up a pen tone book and you know, find the right match. No hassle whatsoever. So that was basically the kettle parts that we um, designed. And then we submitted um, the, 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 the proposal and um, fortunately and unfortunately we won the competition, okay? So I really, really freaked out um, when the news was announced because it's like holy shit you know how, how are we actually gonna deal with this you know over the next um, year with such a small team so um, I, I went up to my partner um, Michael Beirut you know I said hey Michael I have this dilemma here you know we got this really amazing project but you know it can get a lot you know bigger than what we know here right now um, it can have a lot of books and you know exhibition materials diagrams, whatever. And I said, what do I do? And um, his recommendation was what, you know, just put a logo on everything, okay? <laughs> when in doubt, put the logo on everything. And we kind of did. Um, so, 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 so the project, you know, just started to happen um, really quickly over, you know, the next um, period of 10 months. Um, we pretty much um, designed, um, a lot of things, okay, um, these small um, materials um, inside the exhibition, and um, the exhibition itself um, was designed by um, the architecture firm Leong Leong, and they did this really amazing job, you know, um, um, for this really kind of, you know, um, antiquated um, pavilion space that was actually just on site. So um, the exhibition space was conceived really as a, um, first of all, a working office, but also as a repository of all these um, 1,000 um, projects, okay? So there were really actually like 1,000 um, architecture projects in this space. So these projects would be displayed um, along the wall, okay, along the space. And then these projects would be presented as booklets, and this is where our um, collaborators came in because there was no way that we could actually design 1,000 books, you know, uh, with the labor, you know, with the resource that we had. So what we did was that we um, designed the template. Okay, so this is a cover um, that you will have the, um, the logo of the um, architecture firm, the name of the project, the dates and all that with an image, okay? So this is another um, example. So these are in design um, templates that we created. And then for the inside, we did very simple layout, you know, for the text as well as for different chapters and images. Okay, super, super easy. Anyone can use it. And then we packaged these in design um, templates and then we distributed it to the researchers and the architects who are actually working on the content and the materials. And at the end, we collected 1,000 files, packaged files, and then we sent them to a printer. That was easy, right? So um, this was the opening um, of, the, um, of the exhibition, so a very simple sign. Um, and it was really great to actually see, you know, uh, these 1,000 booklets just beautifully um, kind of, you know, covered all the wall spaces um, inside the space. And then these um, booklets were displayed chronologically. And you will see that, you know, the cover images 
we go from black and white um, photos taken, you know, in turn of the centuries and before color photography kind of came into um, the dialogue and eventually it will become um, color. So it's a kind of very beautiful spectrum um, that goes across um, the, 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 the space. And um, of course the visitors were mostly um, architects, you know, from different countries and from different offices. And it was really exciting to see that they actually um, would go up and pick up these books, you know, and really read them. Okay, so that was another really exciting um, thing for us to see. And then there are other um, components to the exhibition, you know, posters, of course, you know. We actually designed these. We didn't give it out. Um, these are great, you know, design opportunities. Um, so on the left is actually a timeline um, of 100 years. That's about architecture firms um, operating outside of USA, and we kind of warped it into this circular form. And on the back of the um, poster is basically these 1,000, um, you know, projects arranged by the themes, you know, um, they're appropriate. Okay, it's a detailed shot of the, um, of the poster. And then just other stuff, you know, that the exhibition uh, would need over time. Um, there were lectures and, you know, workshops and so on and so forth. But what was um, also really exciting was these four um, publications that would come along um, with the project. We have already um, finished two um, books right now. So these four books, again, you know, looked at Office US through um, different, four different lenses, you know. So we finished um, these two, Atlas and Agenda. So I'm gonna start with Agenda. So Agenda is a much thinner book, uh, you know, as you can see here. It's sort of like a reader with a lot of essays and um, diagrams and images that kind of look at um, the 100 years through 25 different themes, okay? So um, the, 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 the essays were organized by these themes, but then um, these essays um, were also period specific. So in order to kind of illustrate the period that this essay was responding to, we created this kind of timeline on the side of the book, you know, so that it spatializes um, this kind of chronology. We're always interested in spatializing um, a book so that it's not just a layout or a spread, you know, I really hate the term um, spread or, you know, the term layout because, you know, the book itself is literally a three-dimensional space that compresses time and narratives and we're always trying to explore that, okay. So um, here are some examples of the, um, of the book spread. So everything um, is here laid out with the Arial and Times New Roman fonts. So, you know, really text heavy, um, very dense um, pages that kind of um, look at the 25 issues, you know, as a kind of executive summaries. And then um, logo um, collage of the um, firms that are involved in the exhibition, you know, in the research. And then again, timeline, okay, 100 years of um, the, the birth and death of architecture firms um, who operated outside of the US and where they operated. And then um, specific case studies, you know, on American um, architects working outside of USA. In this case, um, it was in Japan about architects um, building um, housing and residential complexes in Japan. Um, stories around um, skyscrapers, you know. So um, out of the um, 16 skyscrapers, um, I think eight of them were actually built and designed by American architects. That's something interesting. And then, you know, there are these kind of, you know, briefing moments um, in the book. It's really information heavy. So we wanted to have like these briefing moments, you know, by creating these um, beautiful patterns, you know, as a kind of moment of peace. And then a lot of diagrams, you know, that we um, collaborated with the um, researcher at um, MIT Architecture Department. So they would actually create the basic, you know, the base diagram, and we would actually work on the graphic quality of it, the line weight, the colors, the um, density of things. And our diagram, you know, about incinerators, um, very strange topic. So that was um, Agenda. And then uh, there's this humongous book, is Atlas. So Atlas is basically 
the um, the book list, the 1,000 book list in the exhibition compressed into one uh, major book. So you can already imagine that, first of all, it covers 100 years, literally, and then it has um, 1,000 architecture projects, literally, and it has all the firms associated with it. Um, it's a very kind of, you know, image-driven um, book, so um, it, it organizes in such a kind of rigid and very disciplined way that, okay, first of all, you will have like a like an overview of um, the projects and then the firm, um, the history of the firm um, profile, the year they worked on that project, and then there will be a magazine or newspaper clips that were specific to the project. So again, you know, it's visually very rich. You see a lot of historical uh, materials in this book. And of course, diagrams, you know, about certain um, events, um, currents that happened in the past. For example, here is um, a diagram about the attacks on U.S. embassies over time. And then this is another diagram that's about um, um, firms that were kind of, you know, uh, diverge from this very large architecture firm called ACOM. So, you know, this is about the um, ACOM family trees, okay, how one company could actually breed um, so many other um, small firms. So that was, you know, Office US, and then we're still working on a project, you know, we're working on um, the third book, um, and hopefully it will come out um, I hope um, springtime or early fall, so um, look out for that. Um, so in addition to um, graphic, um, kind of graphic heavy projects, we somehow got into, uh, I would say, spatialized design. I don't want to call it architecture because we don't design buildings, we don't design um, autonomous build structures, but rather um, we deal with um, a given space. Sometimes it's an existing um, condition, that we have to change um, either the nature um, of, the, of the space or um, to actually invent something that's entirely different. So this project, um, it doesn't have like a branded name. It's called Meadow Shit, and we've been calling it Meadow Shit um, with a client since day one. So this place is in Taiwan. That's where I'm from. Um, we have a really incredible uh, client there who is the um, CEO of a development company. So we initially were brought in to design the identity and marketing material for a residential project that um, he's developing. That was really great. But um, very quickly, um, we started to get a lot more projects from him. And most of them were identity until um, one day he asked us if we, if we would help him to design this metal shed, which he already has. So we said, okay, what is this uh, metal shed? It's basically a warehouse that's emptied right now, okay? So um, it is made with um, corrugated metal. You know, there's nothing really exciting about that. So he would like to like activate, reactivate the space and hopefully make it a revenue generating um, business. So previously, this metal shed um, had other, you know, concepts to it. Um, this was an example that shows um, that the metal shed was designed as the showroom for this residential um, project that he's developing, okay? The architect um, is big architecture, so they're de designing the um, residential. And then this metal shed was kind of imagined as a showroom, but that didn't happen. Um, they built something else that's really, really great. But then um, the chairman said that, okay, um, I would like to use this metal shed, first of all, as a kind of greenhouse, okay? He had a lot of very creative ideas that somehow don't reconcile with one another. So this is one, this is one of those cases, okay? He wanted to make it a greenhouse. And then he wanted to grow mushrooms too, okay? So because, um, there's an abundance of different types of mushrooms in that region. Okay, great. And then he wanted to somehow feature shipping containers um, inside the metal shed. So we're like, what's going on, what, you know? So that was really the brief itself. There was no marketing um, material. There was no other research um, to us. So it was basically these three things that we kind of we had to figure out how to um, amalgamate them together, okay? So we thought that, okay, to put a greenhouse um, inside a metal shed um, is very strange, you know? What, what are the reasons for, for people to actually come in here, right? So the idea of greenhouse is that it should be outside and it should actually receive 
plenty of sunlight. So how can we actually make this space a lot more interesting and you know, give people reasons to actually come in? So we kind of imagine this space as a kind of, you know, um, First of all, it's a retail space, but it's really about um, how you can actually turn yourself from just a pure consumer to someone who's actually participating the whole cycle of the um, of this space. So we kind of look at you know how we currently consume you know particularly food you know right. So as a consumer, it doesn't matter um, where you go you know Whole Foods or you know Italy. You're still um, purchasing things only, and then you walk out of the space. And we thought that by having um, a greenhouse inside the space, it will actually allow the visitors to actually pick up the um, the vegetables vegetables themselves, and then what can they do afterwards? Maybe they can actually cook the vegetables on site. So these ideas begin to kind of um, emerge. So you know, um, hot pots um, are very, very pop popular in Taiwan. It's pretty much the, it's like the most, I would say, convenient, you know, and easiest food that you can do. Um, as the owner of a, a, you know, of a hot pot restaurant, you don't have to do anything. You just have to get <laughs> the pots and you get a broth and then you get the ingredients and that's that, you know, and people will cook their own food. So we thought that, you know, having a kind of um, restaurant that's like a hot pot restaurant would be really, really great. So, um, you know, the, the, the visitors can pick out um, the vegetables and the mushrooms and then just eat them and cook them right away. And afterwards, they can go shopping, right? There will be other retail um, opportunities in this space. So that kind of just, you know, um, shaped up the, 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 the very basic concept of it. Um, so one thing that we did learn is that in order for the greenhouse to, um, to sustain, it really has to be on the east side of the, uh, of the building so that it could receive plenty of sunlight, especially um, during morning time. So okay, we know that we had to put the greenhouse on the um, east side of the building. So what we did was that, first of all, um, we, um, we placed the greenhouse really on the east side as a kind of you know, ongoing wall that just like a giant greenhouse wall on the east side. And then we put the shipping containers, okay, let's not forget about the shipping containers, they have to be there. We put the shipping containers on the opposite side um, of, the, um, of the building, and these shipping containers will have mushrooms in them, okay? You would grow mushrooms in these dark house, and imagine each container can have one type of mushroom, so it's really like, you know, a la-la land for mushrooms, great, okay? So we kind of place the mushroom and the, um, the greenhouse, and then in the middle, it would be um, the restaurants as well as the um, shops, okay? It's just kind of, you know, mapped out in the middle, and the two sides will be bridged um, together by um, the walkway that's on the second floor. So that's a very kind of simple um, conceit. And then um, what would these, you know, station, retail or restaurant stations look like? So we came up with different configurations and we want to kind of have a theme, you know, to, uh, to, to the retail um, space because there was basically no uh, directives from the client, you know. Um, he didn't even know what he would sell in, um, in a place. So we thought that, well, why don't we have this kind of, you know, um, national themed, you know, station. So it's like a big festival of different cultures and um, the producers, you know, come to celebrate this place. So in this case, it will be um, a Danish themed um, station. You can see that there's a beer station there and the graphics will have, you know, the crowns, you know, um, from Denmark. And then we develop um, several more, you know, you see that there's the station from Japan um, and the station from Mexico, for example, in which you would see like, you know, the Inca, you know, um, graphics throughout. And then, okay, so we need to kind of also look at the wall's condition, right? So on the east side, we knew that it would be greenhouse, a giant greenhouse wall throughout. But on the east side, um, which is the mushroom wall, outside of the, um, the, 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 the walls, we want to also make it green, okay? So since um, they house mushrooms, we just created these really weird looking kind of, you know, alien looking mushrooms and patterned them throughout these um, containers. And then on the north and south side, again, we want to keep this green belt going along um, the surfaces of the building. We want to grow real vines, you know, on the north and south side. So it's basically the idea of green being materialized differently through different, um, four different walls. So, you know, this is um, what it looks like, you know, um, from the west side, these very strange um, giant 
containers that have mushrooms in them, and this is the daytime. So it's a kind of, you know, um, semi-open space. And this is a view on the inside. So you see that there's kind of really exuberant collage-like energy um, in the space. It's still really raw, but it's also um, super graphic. Okay, so this is the second floor. There's a, a sushi chef making sushi there, and you can cook your mushroom somewhere. Okay, so this is that. Another um, project for the same um, chairman, the same client, um, is uh, an incubator space um, design. So it was, again, a very just kind of unusual uh, assignment. Um, he's got a, a given space. Um, in the basement um, inside a building in Taipei. So um, they're really, really large basement spaces um, in B1 and B2. So he said that he wanted to make it kind of like co-working space, but um, also he wanted to make a retail space. So the whole, the, the intent behind it was to encourage um, young entrepreneurs and designers in Taiwan to go to this place and use it and, you know, create and collaborate. Okay, so that was a very simple um, intent. So um, we um, were assigned to actually work on the naming, um, the identity, as well as the space design. So it's really like a perfect project for us because we have to, you know, really think about it holistically. So we named um, the place Base, okay. Um, we initially named it basement because it's literally in the basement but it's also a base and the chairman said well I cannot say basement you know let's just make it base all right so um, we went with base and we created um, this graphic identity that's really based on the kind of comic book um, language um, because of its youthfulness and because of its you know um, the joy that you kind of feel when you look at the um, when you look at the graphics so you know here um, the um, talking bubbles, you know, um, these, you know, graphic motifs that you would see um, in comic books appear and then become a very important element in the whole identity um, system. And then for the space, you know, um, it's a very large space that we knew that it would have offices, you know, to house these young entrepreneurs as well as retail space, so that means that you need some sort of display system. Um, so we created, we designed this kind of really simple peg and board um, furniture system that can be just basically allow you to um, create different kinds of spaces with very simple elements. Okay, so here you see that um, with these simple pieces, you can actually make a dining station or um, a point of sale or shelving and storage or even like as large as a meeting room. It's all made up with peg and boards, super, super easy. And then there are other furniture systems too that just based on the same um, logic and principle. And then these um, modules, there's, they're meant to be um, office spaces for um, the entrepreneurs or for the retailers who sell their stuff, um, was also based on this very simple um, peg and board system. So we created different sizes that can actually you know, allow different types of um, businesses to go in. So the whole thing is very flexible, it's very elastic, it's modular, but it's made up with very, very simple elements. Um, the cafe is also designed with these, you know, peg and board. So you begin to see that it's a very, very simple material, very, very simple construction method. But then now when it's engaged with um, graphics, it has a total different look and feel and attitude about it. So this is the um, floor plan. As you can see that in the middle is the kind of communal um, space where people can have coffee, you know, um, sit down, and on the left and right is the retail space. And there's another floor downstairs, that's where the um, offices are. So um, this is, a, you know, a rendering that shows what it may look like, you know, at the entry um, area. And then um, here we really begin to, you know, um, I would say infiltrate, you know, the space with um, the graphic um, elements so that, you know, they really kind of activate the space. And then we will use these graphics to actually define um, different zones, you know, with different colors. For example, the furniture zone could be green, um, the accessory zone could be pink, so on and so forth. Okay. So it's really, really fun. So this um, project right now um, is being kind of uh, close to uh, finish in terms of the construction drawings and we're super excited about it. Um, can't wait to see it coming alive. Okay, so this is the B2, um, basement two area where these are um, the offices, you know, and you see that we kind of use the um, talk bubbles to 
um, activate the space and also as a kind of you know, signage system um, for navigation. Okay, next project. So uh, we, we have done um, many identity um, projects over the last three years or so. And um, what's interesting is that um, we kind of began to really look at um, type, typography, or even typeface design as a kind of primary, first of all, not just the element itself, but really as an entry point to think about the identity um, for either a organization or for an event or for a product, so on and so forth. So um, this project, um, the, we, we created this typeface. It's a stencil typeface, okay? The client um, is called T-Box. So T-Box is a uh, tea commerce um, based in India. Um, they um, got a lot of really great um, reviews, you know, um, in the blog sphere, mostly um, before it was all in the tech section, okay, in different um, blogs. Um, the, 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 the genius of T-Box was that um, it expedites the time of tea um, shipping, okay, meaning from the time the tea is picked up from the tea garden to a consumer by like hundreds of times. So very few people um, know, including myself before, that the time frame um, between the tea, the harvest tea, to a consumer t would take up 12 to 24 weeks. Okay, so we're looking at several months. And sometimes these tea um, would sit at warehouses waiting to be either auctioned or to be um, resold to other vendors. So the entire process can, can take up up to a year. So the tea bags that you drink um, are basically stale tea. And very, people, very few people actually know that tea has to be drank fresh. Okay, I didn't know that. I always thought that you have to, you know, really age um, the tea, sort of like, you know, aging um, ham or um, wine, but it's actually quite the opposite. So um, Tea Box um, managed to actually work with um, the tea gardens in India directly and get the tea to their um, facility and package them and ship them to consumers in a matter of a week. Okay, so that is a big, um, profound um, difference. And the tea does taste a lot, a lot better, okay? So um, we, we were approached by the founder um, of Tea Box, Kushal. So he said, well, you know, our business is, is in operation for like two, two, two years now. We're gaining a lot of um, attention, but we feel that we don't really know how to talk to global consumers, you know? And we do have a very large um, global audience out there, people from Germany, from France or from America, they're main customers of ours, so we really want to elevate um, our brand image. So that was um, the task. So um, they um, flew me there to, to um, India, to the Darjeeling um, area. That's where a lot of their tea gardens are. Um, so um, the first thing that we did um, was to, okay, taste, taste your tea, which was really great. But I was also brought to um, these mega, gigantic warehouses where um, tea is typically stored. And it was really a terrifying scene because these bags and bags with, with, of tea would just sit there for like months and months. And there were like, you know, rats and um, bugs. So it was really, really um, terrifying. So. Um, we also went to um, the tea estates, you know, there in the mountain in Darjeeling, which was really, really beautiful. And what was really um, kind of just shocking to me when I got there and saw the places and the people is that these tea estates, they all seem completely frozen in time, okay? So these are some images that I took um, while I was there. Um, so you see that the... Um, the, the, the machine that you see on the upper left was actually shipped by the um, British to the mountain in India about 100 years ago. Okay, that, that, that's a machine that's still like in use right now. And then there, there are all these like just piles and piles of records of somehow. It seems that um, there's this kind of residual uh, colonial habit there, you know, about record keeping. That's still very much prevalent. So it's just piles and piles of stuff. 
But what was sort of eye-catching was that I noticed that on all these um, crates where they ship the um, tea, still use this beautiful um, stencil, okay? So I guess it's, it's because of, you know, um, it's fast, you know, it's uh, easy to do. And I saw it everywhere, okay, of different kind of stylized um, typography. So I was very curious about this whole kind of stencil um, history to it. So when we came back, um, we, we, we researched on basically tea crates over um, centuries, okay, not just tea crates from India, but also from China. So, you know, tea um, was originally from China. And um, the discovery was quite profound um, that, you know, on these shipping crates, people have been using stencil type for centuries. That's really, really great. So we thought that, well, you know, there's this piece of history that is graphic, that is typographic, but that is also very essential about the culture and the, um, the production of tea that became sort of like the entry point of the, um, of the identity design. So we developed um, this stencil typeface that's actually based on avant-garde, okay? Unlikely choice. Um, so it's, um, it's, it's, really, um, it's really, really simple, but you know, it does you know, create this kind of more contemporary um, look and feel to it. And it's actually very effective for um, all the communication materials, you know, from uh, the packaging to the website, um, and then we created three weights. So there will be um, the normal weight, the medium weight, and then the bold weight, super bold, okay? And that design basically informed everything else that we do. So after that, you know, it was basically no brainer to actually roll out this entire program. And all the pictograms were designed based on the stencil um, style. It's a family of things. And here you see that it's the, the stencil type is used very large, you know, um, on the stationary, and then when it comes to the packaging, um, it became this kind of very um, grounding, you know, um, piece on the packaging itself because, you know, there were different themes and different packages that we kind of have to dress them um, differently with colors, with patterns, but it was really this um, typeface that kind of holds everything together. So this is another collection um, of their products. Um, these are, you know, the, the smaller um, flavor-based um, sample packs. Again, you know, it's the stencil type that kind of holds everything together. And this is a collection of their teaware, um, a very different look and feel, you know, white as the background. But again, this is typeface that kind of creates a, creates a connection with other um, packaging. Vacuum packs, you know, so this kind of overview um, of everything um, together. So it was kind of a very simple um, idea that's taken from what is there, what was in the history, and then we somehow made it, you know, contemporary and feel kind of um, more urban. So this was tea box. Oh, there's websites. And you see that the stencil type um, works really well as a display um, typeface, you know. And then they actually do use it um, very liberally in their advertising now, which is really great um, to see. All right, the next typeface um, that we call Heritage Geo. It's a very, very strange name. So um, this um, typeface was actually designed for um, AIA's Heritage Ball. Okay, so it's a very important fundraising program um, that happens once a year. So uh, we were assigned to design the, first of all, the invitation. Always starts out with the um, invitation and save the date. Um, and you know, that's the moment where, where you really define the, the language you know, of the design, despite that you don't know what else is coming. So um, we created this um, stretchable um, type you know, that we call um, Heritage Jill. So it kind of works, you know, as a kind of space filler, okay? It's a kind of elastic space filler that would just fill up the entire given space, meaning like the width of the column. So it's a sort of like a different way, typographic way to really think about how architecture works, you know, that it really has to change itself in order to actually work for the people, okay? So it's a kind of very different lens to actually think about the same problem. So here you see that we basically just, you know, um, fills up um, two columns, and um, this is a kind of animated um, version of that. So there's also this kind of playful um, quality to it. And then when the type is set within a given space, you can just, you know, slide it left and right. 
very, very easy. So this was an announcement. Um, so this um, idea, this solution um, worked really, really well because there, um, there was a lot of content, you know, a lot of text in these um, announcements. So um, this type just basically became the kind of conduit, you know, to um, the message. So these are the um, different um, collaterals, you know, printed materials that we did from brochure to invitation, save the date. And also, you know, there are other booklets and programs. They're all kind of, you know, based on this typeface, okay? So that's the stretchable heritage geo. And um, this was a kind of whimsical project that um, we did, but we never really continue with it. We never um, finished it. So we can say that it's still ongoing, okay? It's called Pentagram Grotesque. So this is... Um, our logo, Pentagram, it's set in um, modern 20, okay? Um, I really don't know the reasoning behind um, modern 20, okay? So I, I joined Pentagram in 2012, and I guess nobody really kind of cares about that, right? So the functional logo is great. We're all used to it. So um, I was actually assigned um, by um, the partners, you know, we have different task groups to work on different issues. So I was asked to actually look at how we kind of present our projects, you know, will we continue to present them in a book that we publish once every, once every few years? Will, will we do something that's more modular, that's more print on demand? So we started to really look into these, you know, um, in, in, in use um, graphic elements. So um, Modern 20, typeface is similar um, to Bodoni. It has these really beautiful but a little bit quirky um, curves to it, you know, very contrasty, um, thick and thin. So we want to kind of, I, I actually researched the um, history of uh, Modern 20, um, and I couldn't actually find much about it except that it was designed by um, Ed Banguiat. And there was no, like, you know, written materials um, about Modern 20 except that it adds class to any kind of material. Great, okay, so I guess that explains a lot. So we want to kind of do <clears throat> a sincere version, okay, of that, just based on um, the characteristics of um, modern 20. So as you can see that um, we have um, these really kind of quirky um, tails, you know, in the um, lowercase um, characters that somehow echo the tales of um, modern 20. So it's a kind of, you know, sans serif interpretation of this kind of very classic um, typeface. So this is the um, full alphabet that um, that's not entirely um, resolved yet. Um, we're waiting to uh, continue to work on this when we have time uh, mm -hmm. one day. Um, so, you know, this is what it looks like when it's um, large. So, you know, I began to see the potential um, of this, and it was just one of those, you know, ideas that had nothing to do with um, any kind of, you know, uh, client-based um, projects, but we thought that was something really, really interesting to um, do, and we have a lot of this kind of thing happening um, on the team, and I think that it's like, the, the, it's like a way to, you know, again, put yourself a little bit away from, you know, um, the pressure and the demands of the client client facing um, project, but kind of really think about other issues and really kind of think about um, what your interests are. Okay, so last uh, typeface and project that's called Closed Heavy. So this is a, um, a project that we're actually working on right now um, for an exhibition at the um, storefront for art, art and architecture. So um, the exhibition is called Closed Worlds, okay? So the exhibition is about 41 projects, closed systems, from submarines to mental hospitals to offices to um, air tanks, and they were all kind of built and imagined as closed systems. So here you can see that, you know, um, these are the um, images from um, some of the um, 41 projects. And each project kind of looked at these systems through different angles, but most importantly, to actually look at certain contemporary issues, such as sustainability, energy, recycling, so on and so forth, okay? So there are 41 of these that will be exhibited in the um, space. So we thought that, well, these are all kind of self-contained, you know, really locked in um, system. 
and why don't we create um, a typeface that kind of resonates with that idea. So here you see that um, the, 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 the letter forms are designed all as uppercase systems, but they're entirely um, interlocked um, together, very, very tight, with very, very little negative space so that from far away, you just see these very large blocks, okay? that occupies this space. So this is a, um, a poster um, that, that we're working on, and then some other examples. So you can kind of vaguely, you can vaguely read um, these, you know, if you actually really try. But, you know, um, visually they, they, they do kind of, you know, um, convey the idea of, you know, like closed engineered um, systems. So this is another poster. And it's actually one of the projects, you know, um, in the exhibition. The, it's about the power of, you know, feces. Um, so, you know, it does have this kind of very sci-fi, 70s, you know, sci-fi uh, quality to it, but really, 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 really tight, um, very rigorous, but, you know, has this kind of very happy energy about it, too. So... Um, so that's what I had today, um, and I just want to, you know, like every lecture, every lecture, I want to take the opportunity to um, really thank my team. You know, like I said, I'm more or less as the editor um, of my team, and not the designers. And it's really like the designers' vision that created, you know, our body of work. Thank you. Yes, you can, you can call them, you know, um, a partial typographer. We basically provided um, the, the, the general um, framework, right? And we provided the tool, which is the um, tape itself. So in a way, it's sort of like ink, right? And the installers were basically the people who brought the typography um, to life. So in that sense, yes, you could consider them as typographers, yeah. Oh, it didn't have to be absolutely accurate, you know, and that's sort of the beauty of it is that as long as you give them the general height of the letter forms and then you, the general um, construct, you know, say of a letter, they can just look at it and then just tape it. So there wasn't um, any kind of rigidity that they had to follow. But as long as the type is legible, it's great. Um, I, I tend to, I, I diagram. Um, a lot. I really, really like to diagram, um, and they the diagrams are just very simple, uh, you know, line works. Basically, you have circles, and the circle sometimes, you know, circle will present an entity, be a person, a thing, or you know, uh, whatever. And circle will actually cluster into certain kind of organization. Sometimes it's flat, and then you can use that to talk about, you know, kind of flat organization. Sometimes they're in clusters, and then you can actually organize these clusters differently to kind of talk about hierarchy. Um, I think about things more in a diagram um, manner, not in an illustration um, manner. So you can say that itself is a weakness, also as a, is a strength. I think that I think that we 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 need more time. I think you you do need time, you know, and you need um you need to either create these opportunities where you need to be given these opportunity to really um, investigate enough and to accumulate enough evidence to actually talk about it as a kind of developed, you know, vernacular. Um, so to answer that question, no. But as a kind of method of working or a way of thinking or even just as an interest, definitely yes. And I think that's kind of very, um, very kind of, you know, common like amongst um, designers on my team. So I think that, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of contagious in a way that once you kind of see it, you know, exemplified in, in one example, for example, you know, the um, MPNY exhibition, it will actually encourage, you know, that kind of thinking, but done in probably different ways, yeah. It's actually the, the in-between time um, is not that different from any other um, design practices, you know. So there's always a brief, right, and we would sit together to um, talk through, okay, what the project is and um, certain 
just requirements, more like the bottom line stuff that we have to, you know, be very mindful about. And then um, if there was actually time, time is really um, a problem right now. So if there was time, we would actually look at, you know, if there are any references or inspirations that we all have, right? And we would share these thinkings and ideas. And typically, just really casually, okay, we either look at, you know, say websites together and we'll just click around or we will actually um, print things out, put them together on a board and we look at them. And then I would say bye-bye, you know, see you in uh, 48 hours. And then the designers will come back with their initial um, sketches, you know. And that moment is always the most exciting and sometimes can be the most frustrating um, to me because um, it's highly unpredictable and there are times where you know people feel really inspired and they just have a lot of great ideas right you know that can be shaped up and can be baked into something really great and they're just sometimes people um, kind of feel lost you know in that process because there's no um, sketch for them to to follow so that is actually very exciting but I think that I'm very lucky because um, we have um, in my mind some of the best designers you know on the team so um, rarely I'm disappointed by um, what I see and I always you know see something that's really like beyond um, my expectation most of the times I would actually recommend to keep that as a mystery. I think that I think that not everything is worthy um, unpacking. Really, like I think you know, with our very limited minds, um, we can pretty much unpack everything, right? We think, but I think that there are a lot of just like mysterious forces in the works that you cannot really try to um, make it understandable. Say bullet points or diagrams of things. For example, you know. Um, the, the kind of, you know, artistic quality of things um, are actually influenced by many other non-practical or even non-untangible -un forces, you know, that can be, you know, the weather that you're in, um, you know, at a given moment, um, the smell in the air, or your own um, energy level, for example, you know, um, if you actually went out the night before, you drank too much, you, you're gonna, you're bound to feel, you know, not so inspired and not so creative the next day. These are really, these are forces um, in the whole design process that I think that, you know, um, are mysterious and, and, um, a, a, a graphic designer like me, I don't think I'm really qualified to actually unpack that. I will actually require like a very collaborative large team, you know, and that would be an interesting project to do. But for now, I would say let's keep it a mystery. <laughs> Well, then, uh, I mean, I'll look at, you know, what are the resources we have, you know, budget-wise. Um, it's very, it, I, I can't answer um, this right now because, you know, we don't have that kind of tangible thing, you know. So this is basically like entirely open question, you know. So design is all, all about identifying the variables and try to eliminate the, the variables one at a time. It's that process that eventually would result in some sort of, you know, design, right? But right now, if it's entirely open, yeah, I could do anything. I would just put it on a space rocket if I can, you know? You know, food is actually a very, um, very, very large um, topic. I think that um, what's interesting, I think, right now here, you know, in America, and I think that in, in a lot of other regions um, in the world, is that there's this whole kind of new connection and understanding to food that we previously didn't have, you know, in the 90s and in the early two, two, 2000. So it's really about, okay, going to the source, you know, um, be sustainable, eat fresh, um, eat locally as much as possible. You begin to really see that thinking um, permeating pretty much everything. And you see a lot of um, food businesses, you know, be restaurants or um, products that follow that kind of philosophy, right? But I think that, you know, the um, consumption of food itself, I think, is still pretty devastating. Um, just generally speaking to the whole ecosystem, you know, not just that, you know, um, the, the, the whole production chain 
behind it, I think it's still very mysterious to most consumers. And if you actually really look into it, um, it's a pretty ugly picture, you know. And there are a lot of, you know, dark, there's a lot of darkness to it. There are a lot of lies, you know. Um, even what you see is, you know, the pretty image of um, sustainable food. And also um, packaging itself, I think, you know, um, is also creating, I mean, not that, it wasn't a problem. It has always been um, a problem. It's just that when you, um, for example, like myself right now, when I'm drinking this, I'm actually basically committing a crime here. You, you know, like this would actually end up in the ocean and stay there for uh, millions of years. But I guess, you know, we're not like really um, so critical about our daily consumption choices at the moment. And I think that's when design can really come in, especially in the education process to actually make an impactful, um, you know, lasting um, result, I hope. But right now that doesn't exist, you know, even like recycle, there isn't a kind of codified recycle um, program on the street, none, you know, um, either regionally speaking or nationwide. And why is that, you know, we have um, language, you know, that's being codified. We have street signs, um, highway signs, you know, the green interstate sign that's being codified. How come, you know, um, recycling itself has not been really codified? And that those are the, the topics that I'm interested in. My honest opinion about, um, first of all, I mean, storytelling, you can say everything is storytelling. Everything has a reason behind it, has a narrative to it, has a history to it, right? So in that sense, I find the term storytelling really, really weak because it's commonplace, it's applicable to pretty much anything, every profession. So for, so for designers where, you know, graphic designers, where people who work in the um, communication field to kind of label them as, you know, storytellers, it's kind of really, proud thing. I actually find it pretty sad because I think that um, communication design, it doesn't matter if, whether, you know, what the media um, are, it's actually a lot more complex than telling stories, really. It's about figuring out systems, figuring out how these systems, um, whether it be language, visual, or mechanical, or even structural, can actually work for people and actually last over time. And hopefully make some positive impact on societies. Those have nothing to do with storytelling. So I find storytelling as, a, as an idea itself and as a term itself entirely limiting and I pretty, I despise that. Yeah, it's interesting, we may, we just, ha we haven't, um, we haven't really kind of thought about, right, we haven't thought about like, um, commodifying, you know, um, these um, typefaces. And, you know, um, I never did typefaces myself. And the reason why we actually have plenty of them now is because one of our designers is a typeface designer and um, he's passionate about uh, typeface design. So, you know, because of him, um, we actually, we're now, you know, all learning from him and we do have projects that are very typeface, typeface heavy. So like I said, you know, I'm more an editor and I allow um, people to actually um, excel or to, to, um, to pursue their, their own interests at a, at a moment, you know, at a given time. Just spend less time online, <laughs> right? That's that's really the the, the, the easiest thing, uh, and perhaps the most difficult thing to do. Um, I think that the the danger of um, you know of the prevalence of you know um, smart devices um, is that I don't think we have actually developed. I mean, as a as as a society, you know, and also as in the in the, in, as individuals, it's still relatively new to us, you know. Um, when was iPhone introduced? 2007, right? So it's still relatively new to us. As a society, we haven't developed this kind of, you know, um, awareness about the boundary, you know, where, where do we stop? So it just becomes a kind of knee-jerk um, behavior um, to, to, 
to dive into you know the um, online virtual world, and especially you know through our smart devices. Um, I think that that's a that's a pretty big problem right now, including myself. You know, I um, I, I just you know became aware of that. Sometimes I would just um, lay on the bed, like you know, for hours and hours, just surfing things and uh, endlessly. And it's really like this rabbit hole that's inside a rectangle. You know, that's basically the universe is packed there. Um, so I think just you know be a, li a little bit more mindful about how we engage uh, with the devices. Well, our team um, um, has always remained more, more or less the same uh, size, um, 10 people. And all the names that, that you saw at the end of the um, slide um, are the, the, the staff who have um, or are still currently working with us. OK, so it's not that you know, it's a 30 people. Um, team that would be a very different um, kind of business. So you know, I think that like it's 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 actually quite different to um, manage, say, a three people team um, and a ten people team. You know, there are always these like thresholds that you kind of pass and you begin to feel um, the pressure um, and the difficulty of it, and you just kind of figure out, you know, um, as you go, right? Like you will have very different business problems, you know. Um, logistical financial problems and also just like communication problems um, that you wouldn't have when you're working with two or three people. I think that right now, you know, it's really, like I said, lack of time, you know, um, to, to, to kind of engage with each individual the way that I used to. And I think that's something that um, we're, we're trying to figure out how to, you know, improve that. Uh, so when I was at SVA, um, when I was still a student, um, that, that was 2001, I um, interned at Pentagram for one year, okay, during my school time. Um, I would go there, you know, um, three days a week, and in the summertime, I would go there every day. So I did that uh, for a year, and after that, I just started, you know, a full-time job at Sony Music. Um, it was it was it was very surreal, you know, in a way that um, in I think that in a larger picture, um, Pentagram, 2012, you know, the Pentagram that I um, I returned was actually not that different from the Pentagram that I knew in 2001. So um, in that sense, it was a kind of very surreal, almost a little bit like you know the Twilight Zone kind of um, feeling like you enter the building, everything is still more or less, you know, the same way that it was um, a decade ago. Um, it had not aged at all, and the partners also have not aged, you know, <laughs> but I have. Um, so it was that kind of feeling that's kind of strange. But I have to say that the pentagram that I experienced as um, as an intern there um, was quite different, you know, from being a partner because, you know, you, you, you're, you're an entirely different um, being there when you're a partner. You engage with very different um, issues that you would just normally not think about or not care. It varies all the time and it depends on actually several um, factors. So, you know, like running a business always evaluating multiple factors and sometimes conflicting um, factors, you know, back and forth at the same time. So um, I would think about um, things such as, you know, um, who would be the most fit, right, you know, um, for this project in terms of skill sets, in terms of interest. I think that having interest um, is actually critical to actually do a great job. So I, if somebody actually hates, say, designing website, you know, wireframes, you know, I probably wouldn't ask that person to do that. But I would actually like to challenge that person a little bit by giving like easier um, website to, to, to design. So um, skill sets and interests, and also um, their workload at any given time, just like any um, project. But sometimes it also has to do with the overall um, team energy and just kind of creative energy. If we feel that, if I feel that, okay, we're all on the same projects for too long. It becomes this kind of automated, you know, knee-jerk kind of behavior or that kind of mindset. I will basically ask every designer to actually sketch and participate on one project. By doing that, you create a kind of healthy 
um, tension and competition, you know, amongst the designers. And that's an interesting way to energize um, the, 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 the team a little bit. You know, it's like a sprint, you know, you do that um, every once in a while, and then you go on to marathons again, and you do sprint, and you go on to marathon again. Yeah, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, guys. Thank you.